With that, we're going to sing 207, Take Time to Be Holy. spot there's a half wall but you'll want to bring your chairs with you and uh, we'll just meet back there and brother mike is going to come now and break the bread amen he's going to come and preach so give him your attention have your bible ready and your heart open and i'm sure the lord will bless you tonight brother mike won't you come all right i'm going to invite you to turn in your bibles to first kings chapter 19 for those who have been a part of my messages i've been trying to do some studies through the kings Today is kind of a diversion from that. It's a little bit of a tangent in a way. Of course, you probably heard me say that several weeks ago. And again, that's probably nothing new. I mean, Pastor has his new summer series. He kind of quit the other thing he was doing. We'll come back to that, I know. But uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, it still is related to the Kings in a lot of ways. So I guess I have an excuse of this being a little bit closer to where I'm actually at in my studies with the Kings. So we're going to look at some verses from there. You know, one of the things that I think about as I consider the passage that we're going to look at tonight, you know, we can get pretty weary in the work of the Lord sometimes. And weary in the sense of, not that you don't like what you're doing, but sometimes it's just hard work. It takes a lot of time. It can be very, maybe tedious in some ways. And I've thought about that a lot in terms of, putting together live streams and doing editing and like with all the virtual choir stuff that you might have seen this morning. I love that stuff. And the final results of the things like that, those are things that really make me realize how much it's worth it to at least be able to do something. You've heard us say that a lot, I know. But, you know, sometimes it's, it just gets tiring. And I can't tell you how many times... Uh, in the last three and a half months or so it is now, you know, some of the late nights of editing on my computer. And well, many of you know, I'm a computer guy. I love being on the computer. But, you know, when you're slaving over a video for 12, 16 hours at a time, it's not to say that I don't like it again, but 
it can get a little bit weary sometimes. Yeah, so, you know, when Brother Mike gets up at noon because he didn't go to sleep until 5 in the morning, you know, these are some of the things that I've dealt with. But part of that is, again, we still wanted to provide something for you guys during these times, and we're looking forward to being able to meet more in person, and that's going to mean less of that kind of a burden. Although it has opened up some doors for us where we're going to have some ministry opportunities in the future that are going to arise out of us doing these live streams and recordings now. So pray for us about that. So let's consider what we're looking at here in the passage that I ask you to turn to in 1 Kings chapter 19. You're all pretty familiar with Elijah probably. At the very least, the name. You know the name Elijah. And you know probably that he's a very important character in Scripture. And you know maybe some of the very key moments in the life of Elijah. Like his grand and glorious moment on top of Mount Carmel when, as the, the situation unfolded there, people were led to the point of confessing that Jehovah is God. And they were casting away their idols and they were... Uh, exterminating the prophets of Baal. You know, some of that's kind of gory and bloody, but, you know, all of that to show that God is God. But we kind of come on the tail end of that now in chapter 19 where we are. Elijah's been working hard in what you might call his ministry. And we're going to see maybe one of the weaker moments in the life of Elijah. And maybe this is something that resonates with some of us as we've gone through some of these last few months, having to endure certain circumstances, having to put up with inconveniences, and just otherwise dealing with situations that maybe personally might be uncomfortable. So, looking here at 1 Kings chapter 19, I start reading in verse number 1. It said, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how withal he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose, and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Would you join me as we pray for our service? Lord, thank you for this opportunity again to gather together, and thank you for the lessons that you've shown me even through this time. And Lord, I know that as I bring this message, maybe there will be things that come into people's minds as they consider what we're looking at today. Uh, maybe the struggles of others as they consider them. Maybe their own personal struggles. Who knows? But Lord, I just pray that your word would speak to somebody tonight as it's spoken to me and as it's resonated with my heart as we consider the burdens that we carry, as we consider maybe the heavy loads that other people are trying to bear at this time. Lord, help us to learn how to be compassionate like the Lord Jesus upon those who are struggling. And help us, Lord, to be able to navigate through our weaknesses. Help us, Lord, to be able to use these times of difficulty as opportunities to grow. Lord, I thank you for how you work through this service. And again, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word in this setting. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a few thoughts here concerning this man, Elijah. So I bring to you a message tonight that I'm just calling encouragement for the weary Christian. Because while it may look like it starts off on a very dreary note for our, our friend Elijah here, there's some encouragement here that comes from the Lord where the Lord is showing him there's, there's still a purpose to be around. You know, we read that verse in verse 4. To think that anyone would come to that point in their lives, you see his prayer there. And, and I am calling it a prayer in verse number four. And you see from the wording where he is addressing the Lord and his address to the Lord says, Lord, take away my life. 
In fact, we're going to see by the end of this chapter how the Lord answers that prayer. And probably the rest of you, if you know further on in Scripture, you know where this is going. So I give you hopefully today encouragement for the weary Christian. First of all, let's look tonight about how the Lord provides sustenance. The Lord provides sustenance, we see in verses 1 through 8. We already read the first four verses there. I'll start again at verse number 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruse of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto the mount, unto Horeb, the mount of God. First thing I wanted to show you here, in that the Lord provides sustenance, we see the fear of Elijah as it's manifested. I mean, think about if you're in his situation, wouldn't you maybe react in a similar way if you had this kind of uh, a situation unfolding around the circumstances of your life? Elijah, this faithful preacher of the word of God, is now, he has that red mark on him from King Ahab because of what happened up on the situation on Mount Carmel. That was a a grand experience in showing the power of God, in showing that God is God, showing his strength. And yet now, as a result of that, as happens so often when people are faithful in preaching the truth of the word of God, that you end up making some enemies. And I tell you what, if it wasn't evident before that Ahab was an enemy of preachers of the gospel, I think... The fact that this is happening to him demonstrates that even more. We see in the first couple of verses there that they they want to take his life. And so as a result of that, I mean, think about if you were Elijah in that scenario. I mean, I think it's built into all of us where we have that sense of human preservation, where if we realize that we're in danger, we would do anything in our power to try to preserve our life. That's, I believe, something that God has built into us, that that we have the desire to want to live. And yet we see his request there in verse number four, which in in many ways I I might even consider to be rational in some ways. But again, I think his fear is genuine and justified. You know, and I think about churches that faithfully preach the gospel Many times they make a lot of enemies too. It it is not unheard of for the pastor of a church, such as, uh, you know, might be an independent Baptist or maybe just another conservative Bible preaching church, where someone will maybe send them a letter of some kind saying, you know, we disagree with your doctrine, and uh, then they'll give you 10 ways up and down why they disagree with you and why you're wrong instead. You know, go even a step further. It's not unheard of even before for preachers of the gospel themselves to have death threats put on them because of things that they do in faithfully trying to serve the Lord. So this is a situation that Elijah is in. So we see Elijah's fear. We also see what I'm calling Elijah's depression. And some pe- some preachers have even called it that, that he is in a moment of deep depression here as a result of some of what he's facing. All of your life now, as a servant of the true living God, now on the verge of being cut short by this king, all of what you've worked for, you know, think about pastors in the ministry who spend years building churches, and yet to see that all crumbling down because of things that people do. We've heard of even during these last few months where People got upset with the church because they decided to open their doors during COVID-19 and they ended up burning down the church. You know, situations like that. 
So these are things that are very real to us even, where you're taking a stand, you're, you're not wanting to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, and yet you have people opposing you in such ways. Think about the effect that has on the pastor of a church like that. The, the, the heartache that he then has to feel as a result of, you know, someone just burnt down my church. You know, what, what are we going to do now? Well, I mean, thankfully we still have technological means, but I mean, think about all that went into building that church. I mean, I know it's, it's a physical building in that sense, but you know, there's still a lot of heart that goes into that. And you know, things like that can be extremely discouraging. You know, think about just the daily labors of a pastor. You know, some of the things that maybe sometimes he has to, to, to deal with on a regular basis, even just mundane things. You know, we, I talk about the, the circumstances of, of live streaming. Again, I, I don't dislike what I do, but sometimes the work can just get really hard. You know, and that's a pretty light thing in comparison to some of these other things. So I, I'm trying to keep that in perspective when I say these things. You know, I, you know, I can't minimize some of those other things that happen where people just in their disagreement with the gospel will choose to do things like that. So we see him responding to that, that fear that he has. In fact, you see in verse 3 there, Beersheba there, that's about as far south as you can go within the kingdom of Judah. And, you know, from where he was coming, you know, he was just making a beeline south pretty much. He was trying to get as far away as quick as he could from Ahab. Notice in verse number 3 there also at the end of that verse, this is part of where I think it ties into maybe what some people might describe as his depression. It says he left his servant there. And if you continue in verse 4, it says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and then prayed what he prayed there. You know, some of these things are things that, you know, I'm not a doctor to be able to clinically diagnose people with depression. But with some of my understanding of things is... I've maybe sometimes even had conversations with people and, and reading some of these signs. W- one of the things that I see is that people like to isolate themselves and separate themselves from others. You know, and if I'm honest with myself, I've had some of those tendencies too. It, the Bible says in James 5, 17, Elijah was a man with like passions as we are. And we think of Elijah as this great preacher and minister of the gospel. And yet we see him in such a state here as he is facing what some might call depression and saying some of these things. And so if, if that can happen to him, you know, how much more us? You know, not having been able to gather together as we are tonight, it affords less opportunity to maybe talk with people and find out how they're doing. And, and it, I think it's all the more important that we take advantage of the opportunities that we have to, to just check on people, see how they're doing. You know, there might be someone carrying a heavy burden, so much so to the point where they just they just need a friend to be able to talk to. But again, sometimes when you get deep enough down that rabbit hole, sometimes you're so stuck in that that you just you don't want to be around anybody. And I've had some of those feelings before. Yeah, maybe being a little transparent and saying some of this, but it, it, there are some darker times in my life when I would, when I have pretty much prayed a similar prayer here. I mean, I can't speak for anyone else but myself when it comes to that. And again, you know your heart better than I do. But but to come to that point, so again, if it can happen to Elijah, you know how much more so us. So I hasten on here. Elijah's fear, his depression. We also see what he labels as his insufficiency. I see that at the end of verse number four, at the the end of his prayer, the the reason he said what he said, for I am not better than my fathers. Maybe a few things that I could observe from that. I I don't want to read into what Elijah meant when he said this, but a few things popped into my head when it comes to what... Elijah might have perceived as his own insufficiency here. You know, maybe look at the accomplishments of others. You know, look what you did through other people in their lives. You know, what, what, what about Moses? You know, what about 
Joshua? What about these other great men of God that, that you've used throughout history? You know, maybe I bring up some of these things not so much for the sake of saying it about Elijah, but you know, what are some things that we face when we might be tempted to say some of these things? You know, maybe expectations. You know, we feel like we have to live up to what others have done before. You know, and Elijah may be looking at what happened. You know, look at all of this great stuff that happened on Mount Carmel. And now all of this, you know, what is it amounting to? You know, what, you know, what's going to happen now that, you know, Elijah's on the verge of losing his head pretty much. You know, what, what was all of that for? In having that great display of the power of God only to have circumstances turn on me like this. You know, considering the outcome of these situations. But the thing that I like most about this, and I want to get out of this depressing moment in Elijah's life quickly, as we look at the care of God in this situation, we see in verse number five. Notice here that God was the one that reached out to him. And isn't that so true about many things in our life, in our salvation? God was the one that offered himself to us. And we see God reaching down to Elijah here. Now, how many of you would say that God has taken care of you tonight? You know, and something that I've realized in preparing for this message, maybe I should word that a little bit differently. I think the question should be more along the lines of, do you recognize the fact that God has taken care of you? I'm going to assume the fact that God has taken care of you. It's up to us to be able to see that God has done that for us. And we see God doing that here for Elijah. So we see him sulking there under that juniper tree. And then this angel comes. And you know, as might be the case sometimes if I'm sitting in my bedroom and I'm working late hours on a video or something, you know, my, my mom might come in and touch my shoulder and say, Hey, Mike, you know it's time to take care of yourself. You know, you, you know come, come eat dinner with us or something like that, or they'll call out to me. You know, thinking about it maybe in that kind of a way, just the, the tenderness of God in this situation. You know, there, there are different ways that you can handle people that fall into these situations. You know, I, I feel like sometimes I, I can say the wrong thing and then end up making things worse. And I think we can learn a lot from how God handles Elijah here in probably one of his darkest moments. So he says, arise and eat. You know, we sang that song, come and dine. You know, God is saying to Elijah here, hey, come and dine. You know, eat, eat something. You're, you're, you're weak. You're weary. You, you just need something. You know, doesn't God know just the right moments to be able to reach into our lives and show us that he cares for us still? And I, I like verse number six, I think, especially because of tonight. It says there, uh, behold, there was a cake baked on the coals. Hey, we're, we're going to enjoy a cake here pretty soon, right? Yeah, you know, we had a cake. Uh, it wasn't baked on coals, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> we're going to enjoy some cake a little bit later. But thinking about the, the care that God has for Elijah here and providing for him, just, just a very basic thing. I mean, how, how hard is it to just you know, text somebody or to you know, just send them some kind of a message or, or maybe bring them a dinner or you know, send a gift card to them, send them a letter in the mail. You know, we, we can be like God and reach out to people that might be falling into you know, these deep feelings of inadequacy or despondency. And we see here, thankfully, that he accepted the help. You know, we in our pride sometimes might think to ourselves, you know, well, you know, I'll be okay. I can take care of myself. It, you know what I get from verse number seven when you read that? You see what the angel says the second encounter? You know, God basically is saying, no, you can't do it by yourself. You need my help. And so he says there, because the journey is too great for thee. You know, Elijah is putting this all on himself now to try to make this journey down to Mount Horeb. And God says, the way you are right now, Elijah, you can't do this. You need my help. And so God does something very simple for him. And this isn't the first time. You go a couple chapters before that. 
and you have the widow at Zarephath providing for him. You have the situation before that where you have the ravens bringing him food. This has already been established in Elijah's life. And so I believe God is just reminding him that he's providing for him, that he's taking care of him. So again, acknowledging the struggle that he has with verse number seven there, it says, because the journey is too great for thee. It would be good for us to, to realize our own limitations, I think. You know, we think we can be strong. You know, we think that we can, we can do it. We can get through it. But you know, we need the Lord in these kinds of situations. And especially thinking about the last few months, how much more now do we need the Lord because of what we've been facing as a country, as a state, maybe as individuals? And so God is here taking care of Elijah. I think it's also interesting. Uh, you see verse number eight there, how he went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I, I've had some pretty good meals and I've been to some pretty good buffets in my time. But I've, I've never known any buffet that could take care of me in one meal for 40 days. So I, I think this is really a supernatural act of God in this sense here, where God is showing that God can provide him the strength to be able to make this journey. I also think it's interesting because Mount Horeb is also where Moses had an encounter with God. And we've heard a little bit about that recently where pastors talked about it and going through his studies in Exodus. And there you had a similar circumstance where God took care of Moses up on the mountain where he got the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments and took care of him there. You know, no food, no water for 40 days. How would you like to go without water for 40 days? You know, dur during a hot Colorado summer, you know, 90, 100 degrees out there. You know, that would have to be a miracle, right? And so God here is showing that he can take care of him. So not only does the Lord provide sustenance, thankfully there's something even more important than that. The Lord provides his presence. We continue in verse number nine. And he came thither unto a cave, and he lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord is not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord is not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord is not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Praise the Lord for the still, small voice. You know, isn't that how God often reaches out to us? Let's consider this. We see in verse number nine, God initiated the conversation. Just as God initiated the encounter with providing his meal, God also begins the conversation. And it's something very similar to maybe what we saw in Genesis chapter three. You know, Adam, Adam, where are you? And again, these questions that we discussed in our Sunday circles this morning are often not for the sake of finding out the information, but especially in the case of Adam, it was because of the desire for that fellowship and for wanting to restore that fellowship. God wasn't asking him because he didn't know where he was. He just wanted, he wanted to talk with Adam. You know, Adam, what's, what's happened here? So what we discussed in particular this morning was Luke chapter 2, when we talked about 12-year-old Jesus. And again, I don't know any 12-year-olds that, well, I, again, I said this morning, you know, sometimes children can surprise us with some of the things that they say. And, and I mean that in a good way. You know, sometimes they just blow our minds with some of the things that we think they don't know, but they really do know. So you have the 12-year-old Jesus in Luke chapter 2, who is both hearing and asking questions of the spiritual leaders there in the temple. And again, we brought up that point. Is Jesus asking these questions because he doesn't know the answers? You know, I bet that's what, what they thought when he was asking those questions. But yet he confounded them with his answers. And 
Jesus continued to do that throughout his earthly ministry. And so again, these questions are not so much to find out the information, but because in this case here, God, God wants the ear of Elijah. More important than that, God wants the heart of Elijah. God wants Elijah himself. Hey, Elijah, wh- why are you here? Wh- wh- what are you doing? Why did you come to Mount Horeb? God already knows the answer to that. And, and maybe when we get those promptings in our spirit, when God is asking us those questions, perhaps, it's not because God doesn't know. But it's because God does know and God wants to help us. And we're going to see how God uses this to help Elijah. We see his answer here. It, it pretty much all boils down to the idea that he's standing faithfully. I am a servant of God. I've done all of these things for you, Lord. But I'm all alone in doing it. You know, do, do we get that feeling sometimes that we're standing all alone on something? You know, maybe we're the only person in a room that takes a stand for the word of God. Have you, do you know what that feeling is like when you're in those situations and there's that prompting in your spirit to, to want to say something, to want to, to be an, an example for the Lord? And so Elijah here is expressing this sentiment that maybe we sometimes feel. Lord, I'm all alone in this. You know, and I think maybe sometimes because of the fact that we are, we are a conservative Bible preaching church that maybe sometimes we feel alone. You know, we're, we're kind of the, we're the odd man in the crowd, so to speak, even, though, even among other Christians. You know, we feel like we can be all alone because of the positions that we take. And sometimes that can be discouraging. If you're you know, in a room of 100 people and you're the only person actually standing on the word of God for what it says, that, that can be pretty disheartening. And so Elijah here, this is the concern that he expresses. So God doesn't say anything back right away other than to say in verse 11 there, go forth and stand upon the mount. So he's there at Mount Horeb. And so right on the heels of that instruction, and I don't know how much time passes between this and the next sentence, but it says, Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains, and then talks about the earthquake, talks about the fire, shows him all of these great things that manifest his power. And and in a way, I kind of think to myself, this this is God again showing himself that he is God, that he has power over nature, just as he did uh, at the confrontation up on Mount Carmel when he you know, sucked up all that water with the fire that came down from heaven. Just a grand display of the power of God. So God, again, showing him some of these things. You you see a phrase that's repeated in verse 11 there a few different times, and verse 12 as well. All of these great things, and yet you have that phrase there, but the Lord was not in it. (laughs) Whoa, whoa. The, the, the Lord was not in this. You know, am I saying now God was not in that fire that came down from heaven? Well, I, I, I know what we mean when we say that sometimes. Is, you know, we're, we're trying to, to focus on maybe the positives of a situation. If, if we're saying that the Lord is in something, you know, maybe we could say the Lord is in our current world circumstances. In, in many ways, yes, I would agree with that. He is. And God does show himself strong. You know, was, was God in 9-11? You know, was, was God in Hurricane Katrina? You know, was God in maybe a personal circumstance where you have a loved one who's facing some kind of an illness or uh, some kind of a, a horrible situation? Is God in that? Maybe it's the passing of a loved one. Is God in that? We see all of these things that happen. Is the Lord in it? Well, maybe not in the same way that the Lord is saying what he's saying here. Because I, I think the contrast that I make here will maybe illustrate more what I mean when I they say it, when it says here that the Lord is not in these things. Because you see, the very last thing that I didn't mention in verse number 12 there, there was that still, small voice. I think God is trying to get his attention off of the big showy things. You, you like seeing all of the great miraculous power of God, but I, what I want you to focus on, Elijah, 
is my still small voice. That's what I want you to listen to. You know, just as we have Brother Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about the power of his resurrection. You know, we often have to associate with that the fellowship of his sufferings, and that's the part that we don't like in that. You know, and again, I mentioned the circumstance a chapter ago. Elijah's already seen the great power of God manifested through his faithful service as he, he alone took a stand in that situation. But I think God is trying to get, again, his attention onto his presence. Not, not only do I want you, Elijah, I want you to want me. I want you to focus on that small voice. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but in verse 13, that's where Elijah responds, is after the still small voice. Some other verses to consider with this. Pastor preached last week in Matthew chapter 28. Lo, I am with you all way, even into the end of the world. Amen. God has promised us his presence. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, again, alluding to other Old Testament passages. The Lord will not leave thee nor forsake thee. Some other wonderful promises. And, and the reason for that, you read in verse number 6 there, so that I can say that the Lord is my helper. You know, we talked earlier about that feeling of self-sufficiency. Oh no, I'll take care of myself. If you focus on the Lord and you let him into your life and let him into your situations, that's when you can say what it says in verse number six, that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Elijah was in a situation where it's very legitimate to have a fear of what man can do unto you. Of course, we know what Jesus says in the New Testament. Fear not them which can kill just the body, but fear him which can kill both body and soul. You know, if he's going to fear anyone, he's to fear the Lord. And that should be the same for us as well. So the question for us then is, are we focusing more on the miraculous power? How is God going to deliver us from these situations? How is God going to deliver us from COVID-19? How is God going to deliver us from these other horrible world circumstances or natural disasters. And, and so many times we want to see the hand of God come down and do something wonderful. Oftentimes things just end up being very mundane. And God says, listen to my still small voice. I was having a conversation with my mom somewhat recently where I, I made a comment basically to the effect of it, it's not so much the circumstances that happen to you in life that matter as much as how you react to those situations. That's what people are going to see. That's where they're going to see that true spiritual growth in your life. That's where they're going to see the power of God is someone being able to overcome their circumstances. So again, all of these things I hope are things that are going to encourage you. We get into my last thing for tonight. The Lord provides sustenance. We've seen that. The Lord provides his presence and how precious that is. We also see that the Lord provides assistance. We see that through the remainder of the chapter here, beginning in verse 13. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that's the still small voice, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And so then he repeats his same argument that he made before, talking about being all alone and faithfully serving the Lord. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholam shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. You know what the Lord is doing here? I, I mean, yes, it, it looks like just a list of instructions here. But something I get from this is the Lord is telling Elijah, I'm not done with you yet. You still have work to do. So, so I go back to verse number four where I said that was a prayer. I see verses 15 and 16 here as being the answer to that prayer. Elijah asked for God to take his life. God instead is commissioning him 
to a continued life of serving the Lord. And again, God is telling him, Elijah, I'm not done with you yet. I still have work for you to do. So he also addresses his concern about feeling all alone. We see some of the beginnings of that in verse number 17 there, where it talks about Elisha, who is to be a successor. Hey, Elijah, you get to train the next generation of people that get to take a stand and do what you're doing. You know, if you're Elisha and you, you know, understood the story of the life of Elijah, how excited would you be about that kind of work? I don't know, but uh, nonetheless, God is showing him that he's not through with Elijah yet. God is still giving him some purpose and being able to train up Elisha to be able to uh, enjoy what is said of later in Scripture as being a double portion of his blessing. And we see later on in Scripture the ministry of the life of Elisha. And, you know, perhaps God would have found another way, but think if Elijah had just continued to sulk here. Would, would we have the same testimony of Elisha that we do? Again, God finds ways of accomplishing his will. The, the question then really becomes... Do we want to be involved in that process? You know, God will accomplish his purposes, but he does want us to be involved in those purposes. He wants us to be willing servants that will go out and serve him. So God is encouraging him in continuing the work. Not only that, verse 18, which I didn't read yet. He said, yet I have left me 7,000 men in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed the knee unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Hail, Elisha, you are not alone. You are not alone in this, Elijah. You don't have to stand by yourself or think that you're standing by yourself at least. So he has these wonderful opportunities to be able to continue in the ministry of the Lord here. I just, again, I love how the Lord handles Elijah in the midst of his depression, in the midst of his uh, discouragement that he's facing, in the midst of his uncertainty about what's going to happen with his life, and, and his own wanting to take his, own, something I didn't mention before, but th this is a thought that went through my head when I made some of these requests before, like we talked about with Elijah. You now, he talked about praying for God to take his life. You know, I don't know that Elijah really wanted to do it himself, if I could put it that way. So he's saying, Lord, if, if my life is going to end, then I want you to end my life. And I think maybe he was thinking more along those lines. It, you know, and there are times that I've faced where things just seem so heavy for me. Again, some of the darker times of my past where I've wanted my life to end. And I've had that kind of a prayer. But all with the thought of, you know, I, I don't want to do this myself. I don't, I don't want to take my own life. Now, sadly, there are people that go down that route. You know, and how can we help them? You know, that's, I think, part of this too. And, and that's part of what we can learn, I think, from the interaction of the Lord with Elijah here. So he's showing Elijah here, guess what? You're not alone. You know, maybe 7,000 people in the midst of a nation of millions doesn't sound like a lot of people. You know, it, making that comparison doesn't sound too promising. You know, what, what are the odds for us here? You know, versus how many people are in the city of Broomfield or in the state of Colorado or in the United States or in the world even? You know, what, what's the proportion of Christians to those who are not? You know, 7,000 men here plus Elijah, so 7,001, in the midst of an entire nation. It doesn't sound like a lot. You've heard it said before, though, I think, from even Pastor Walker, where he says, one with God is a majority. You know, and and I, can, I can say amen to that. Can I also turn it around this way, maybe on a more personal level for Elijah? 7,000 is a lot more than one. 7,000 may not sound like a lot you know, with maybe 10 million people, but 7,000 is a lot more than one. Hey, Elijah, you don't have to feel all alone in this. You know, continue in the work that I call you to do. As we come to a close with this message, I'll share a little bit of my personal testimony and part of how I found Broomfield Baptist Church. You know, when I accepted the Lord some 19 years ago, and I think I mentioned that uh, in, on Facebook uh, in one of our live stream comments, 
you know, celebrating 19 plus years that I have, I have had that assurance of my salvation. Those earlier times in my Christian life, uh, a lot of that came about in. I had some very conservative sources for those things that eventually led me to accepting Christ. And, and I embraced those conservative ideals. But I was in a situation where it didn't seem like there were any others around me that believed the same way. I mean, yeah, I, I found it on the internet. Yeah, that, that's a story in itself, too. And uh, maybe I can tell you sometime in person uh, outside of preaching. But I felt like I was all alone. I felt like there was nobody else that I could stand with. And, and I went through a kind of wilderness in my life where I wondered if there was anyone else out there that believed the same way that I did. It, it, and maybe in some ways it kind of feels like live stream in a church service. You know, how many can relate to that over the last three and a half months? Where, I mean, yes, you get to see people on a screen, you know, but, but what about that human interaction? That, that's kind of what I was missing. This is back in 2000, 2001, you know, where I found all of this information on the internet. But there is that lack of fellowship with those who believed in a similar way. You know, thank God we had, you know, we were able to invite new families into our church today. We're celebrating that. People that are aligning themselves with us and agreeing with us. And we thank the Lord for that. So the Lord showed me something very very profound, and it really kind of developed over time. So I went to college in 2008, and this was, again, years after that initial experience. But that's when God began to show me, hey, Mike, you're not alone. Hey, Mike, there are others that believe the same way that you do. Hey, Mike, you can have fellowship with some of these same people. Praise the Lord for that. I, and little by little, God began opening up my eyes and so it was during my time I was in college down in Florida where it was revealed to me, hey, there's a church in Broomfield. You know, imagine what I felt during that exchange. My astronomy teacher, well, I think I learned about it before that because my, I think my parents had shared some story about Pastor Walker coming and knocking on their door you know, years before I ever knew them. But, uh, you know, my art... You know, and uh, Pastor Walker and I actually had the same astronomy teacher in college, and that's part of how this connection came about. But to find out there is a, a conservative Bible preaching church in your hometown, the joy that filled my heart when I discovered that. And, and again, all coming back to the point of what we're talking about with Elijah here. God is showing Elijah, you are not alone. Now, are you taking a stand for the Lord? You are not alone. You know, there, there might be a couple dozen of us here. That might not sound like a lot in comparison to the world that we live in. But hey, those couple dozen people, I believe, will stand with you. And you don't have to feel like you're all alone. So that's my encouragement for you tonight. The Lord provides his sustenance. He gives us that provision we need at just the right times. He shows us his presence. He makes us listen to that still, small voice. But then he provides that direct assistance. He directly answers the concern of Elijah in showing him, you're not alone in preaching the gospel. So I leave you with that tonight. Would you pray with me as we close? Lord, thank you for this opportunity to, to share your word. And it's so good to be able to do it in person, Lord. And Lord, you know the weariness that I've faced and even these last few months is, is I've even sometimes pondered in my own heart how much, how much it's even worth it, Lord, to, to do what we're doing over live streaming and recording and uh, some of the discouraging times that I faced personally, Lord, that you brought me through. And you showed me that you were working, Lord. And you've shown me situations, even these last three and a half months, where you've made your presence real and known to me. And Lord, you've answered the concerns of my heart and you've shown your provision in so many ways. Lord, how can I thank you enough for what you've done? Lord, thank you. Lord, we enjoy this fellowship and I pray that you'll continue to open up doors for us to do just that. 
But Lord, this is also a commission to us. Lord, an encouragement to not give up in preaching the gospel. To not feel like we're, we're taking a stand by ourselves. Lord, if there's one thing that I've struggled with, it's sometimes that thought that I, I don't want to be bold because I feel like I'd be standing alone. You know my personality, Lord. But Lord, I'm glad that I have your Holy Spirit in me and that I have that strength that even as I think about the, the opportunity of preaching the gospel here in the open air in the city of Broomfield, who am I, Lord? You would call me to do such a thing, and yet you've empowered me to do just that. Lord, I'm nobody special. Lord, I, I have no, no great talent that, that I can attribute to anything except you, Lord, that you, you gave it to me, and that you've provided opportunities to use that talent. Lord, I thank you for all these people, all these people that I pray will faithfully continue to take a stand on your word, that will faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we might see the, Bro the city of Broomfield saved and serving you. Lord, help us to face that opportunity. Strengthen our mouths, Lord. Strengthen our minds. Strengthen our hearts. Help us, Lord. Though we're a small number in, in a much larger number, Lord, we know that that hasn't stopped you in the past, and you've taken that which is small and made it much. So, Lord, we ask you to use this time for anyone that's listening to the sound of my voice, that they would be encouraged to take a stand for your word. Well, thank you, Lord, for what you do in and through that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing a closing chorus now, which hopefully will remind us of the truths that we just heard. I just keep trusting my Lord. Would you sing that chorus with us? I just keep trusting my Lord. that I promised you out of verse 6, maybe a different cake, but uh, thank you for joining us for our service tonight. We're going to enjoy some of that fellowship now.